This morning we're, or excuse me, this evening, <laughs> it's a long week, <laughs> we're uh, looking at Luke chapter 7 and uh, that uh, hopefully familiar story of uh, the woman who uh, came into Simon the Pharisee's house and uh, anointed Jesus' feet with her tears, wiped it with her hair, as well as rubbing uh, precious perfume on his feet. And why it is she did that, I, I'm hoping that as we see ourselves very much in the same place that she was, that we'll also be moved to do the same thing that she did, which is to love the Lord much. Luke chapter 7, let me read the entire story from verses 36 through 50. Uh, the key, of course, is in verse 47. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she had learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. May the Lord bless again his word to our hearing this evening. Now, let's not forget uh, what we're looking at. We're looking at motives as to uh, why we should live the Christian life which entails, of course, putting our sins to death and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, it means denying ourselves, picking up our crosses and following the Lord, seeking to be more like Him, seeking to do His will, seeking to become like Him. Now, we've seen several things uh, so far th that should motivate us to do this. Uh, the first one was faith, and that is the ability to see the reality of what God promises as we see those things and that reality, it should draw us forward to obtain those promises. The only way we're going to get them is in this path. Uh, we saw that this faith works by love. The things that we see are desirable because the Lord has actually changed our hearts by his Holy Spirit and given us a love for those things. So it draws us out after them. As we see them, we love them, we want them. We saw that uh, our union with Christ should cause us to do this. Basically, we are united to Christ by faith. Because of that, we are actually, in principle, seated with him in the heavenly places. The Bible says that because we are, in fact, with Christ in heaven now, seated with him, at least, again, by virtue of our union with Christ, that our minds should be in heaven on the things that are in heaven and not upon the things that are on earth. So... As far as a motive, think about the fact that your Savior, the one whom you're united with, is in heaven now. That should draw your attention, your thoughts up there and make you desire to be with him. Well, we saw last week a more negative motive, that if you don't deny yourself, if you don't put your sins to death to follow the Lord, you will die. 
And the, Paul meant by that, not physical death, which we're all going to have to endure anyway, but spiritual death. It means we're not saved if we're not putting our sins to death and putting on Christ. So there is the threat of death as well as the promise of life for those who, by the Spirit, are putting to death their sins. They are the ones who will live. So if you will do that, you will live, which means live forever with the Lord in heaven. If you're a Christian, that is what you will be doing. You will be killing your sins and putting on Christ. Now this evening we have another motive before us. And this is the kind of, of motive uh, which I should say it, it is a love, but it's a different kind of love. There's really different aspects to love. We've already seen one of them, the fact that God changes our hearts and makes us love the things that he shows us in his word and desire those things. This particular love is a love that is born out of thankfulness for what the Lord has done for us. Now, as I mentioned, there are different kinds of love. There's that kind of love I just mentioned where the Lord has changed our nature to desire certain things. And we should desire to put our sins to death and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ because that is what we want to do. The Lord has already put the desire in your heart and in mine if you're a Christian here this evening. He has also given you a love for himself. We often talk about that kind of love that we should have for the Lord that goes beyond uh, the blessings, beyond the, the, uh, the benefits he's promised us, but actually loves the object or the, the one who gives us these things, that loves God himself, that loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you're a Christian, the Lord has already given you a new nature that just naturally now inclines toward him. In the same way that you incline towards certain things in this world, that you love certain things because it's just simply your nature to do it. Some people incline towards uh, pickles, you know, I mean, that's kind of a crass illustration. But it's, it's just sort of a part of their nature. They like that kind of thing and others don't. Well, in the same way, we come into this world disinclined toward God and righteousness. And um, we are inclined towards sin. But when the Lord changes our nature, it inclines us toward him. We now have a taste and a desire for that kind of thing. So we talk about that quite a bit. But this is picking up the other strand, which is actually loving God for what he has done for us. We are supposed to love him for those things as well. And I believe that that's what Jesus has in view here. You should love the Lord for both of these reasons. But this evening, we're going to focus on the second here we have an example of a woman who was thankful, who loved the Lord because of his mercy. She was a sinner, and I think uh, by that uh, we're to understand that perhaps her profession was that of, um, you know, she was, uh, what today would be like, uh, well, a prostitute, a, a call girl, as it were. Uh, she was unclean, a sinner. She was a wicked woman, and she was well aware of it. But she also knew that Jesus was a great savior. And she trusted in him, and she experienced his forgiveness. She comes into Simon's house and uh, wets, washes Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes his feet with her hair and anoints his feet with the perfume. And these were tears and acts of thankfulness. She loved the Lord and was deeply grateful that he had forgiven her. Jesus said she loved much because she had been forgiven much. Now the question that this example asks us this evening is how much do you love the Lord? If you have been forgiven much, you should love him much as well. And that love should express itself in acts of repentance, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in putting off your sins and putting on Christ by the way, that putting off and putting on is just another word for repentance. That's what repentance is. Uh, I no longer sin, but I begin to do what's right. I put to death the deeds of the flesh, and I put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our love for him should motivate us to faith and to works of repentance. So tonight, let's consider two things. The first one is how much you should love the Lord because of what he's done for you. 
And secondly, how your love should move you to repent or to grow in Christ-likeness. Now, first of all, let's consider how much you should love the Lord. The one who is forgiven much loves much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. You need to see how much you've been forgiven before you're ever going to be able to love the Lord as strongly as you should. So how much have you been forgiven? And we did touch on this a little bit this morning with regard to our poverty. You know, Jesus came in order to make us rich, but we have to see our poverty before we understand uh, what that actually means and what it means to be spiritually rich, how poor, how bankrupt we were. Now, we just touched on it this morning, but there's quite a bit more to it than that. One thing that strikes me is um, as we're uh, interviewing people for membership and they talk about what their life was like prior to coming to Christ and then you know, they, they come to Christ and how the Lord's forgiven them but how they didn't really seem to notice much of a transition in their lives and didn't really have the dark past and the, that stark contrast you know, and that wonderful testimony of how the Lord saved me out of all this incredible wickedness and maybe some of you have that same kind of feeling you wish that your background had been more sinful <laughs> so that your conversion would be more dramatic and your testimony would be more powerful, but you do need to realize this evening that just because you don't have a badly checkered past doesn't mean that the Lord hasn't saved you from a very wicked past because everyone God saves he saves from a wicked past, and that includes you and includes me. No matter how uh, innocent you may have thought you were, no matter how pristine your life seemed to be before you came to the Lord, it certainly didn't appear that way to God, and it shouldn't appear that way to you either. It's important that you see just how black your background was. So how black was it? Well, the Bible, again, points out that you were born with a uh, charge to your account, which was an outright act of rebellion. Sometimes we forget about, you know, we don't understand what it means that Adam's sin was actually imputed to us and how God views that. Remember when Adam was put in the garden and given a particular commandment by God and he acted directly against it and rebelled against the Lord, that that sin was actually credited to you and to me. When Adam ate of that tree and, again, committed a direct act of disobedience against God, he lost so much. He gained so much that he didn't want. But that was credited to you. That was given to you so that when God looks at you, he sees you committing that act. Now, again, you didn't commit it personally, although there are those who believe that we did, in fact, commit it personally. We were actually in the garden with Adam. We weren't there literally, I think, but we were certainly there by way of representation. But it doesn't matter because God looks at you and sees you as committing that act just as clearly as if you did commit that act. When you read Genesis and you read of that story of Adam's rebellion, that was your rebellion. That was your act. That was your sin. That you can actually add to your testimony how bad you were before you came to Christ. I rebelled against God and Adam. Now again, that may not seem as bad to you as it should, but I assure you, that one crime, that one sin, was enough to damn you forever. So again, I think you should include it in your testimony when you're telling somebody what, what God has saved you from. I rebelled against God. I directly disobeyed his commandments. I was born dead in trespass and sin. Now, you know as well as I do, that's not all that's in your past. There's quite a bit more. I mean, most of us came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, after a few years of life. We weren't uh, just born regenerates. And even if we had been, well, we're going to see we still did quite a bit to disobey and dishonor the Lord. So most of us here had sinful water under the bridge before we even came to the Lord Jesus Christ for his forgiveness, and you know as well as I do that those sins were committed against his holy commandments. I mean, if we were to go through the commandments, and I'll do it just briefly, consider what you were guilty of, how many years you spent loving things more than God, persons, things, objects, 
when you should have loved God most of all? How many years did you spend not worshiping him? Or perhaps you were in a church that seemed to worship the Lord, but you were worshiping in, in ways that were really offensive to him because you didn't understand what was pleasing to him. How many times did you use his name in vain, his holy name, which is very offensive to him? Now, here's one I think we can perhaps all resonate with. How many of his Sabbaths did you break? How many times on the Lord's Day did you use the day for what you wanted rather than what he wanted? You didn't keep the day holy. How many times did you dishonor and disobey your parents and other authorities? How many times did you hurt other people or want to hurt others or had lustful thoughts or perhaps committed impure acts, uh, took things that didn't belong to you, lied to get yourself out of trouble, and perhaps in the process got other people into trouble, wanted things that did not belong to you. How many times did you actually want to do these things even though you didn't actually do them? How many times have you thought about doing them? All of these things are sins against God. Now, the Lord says that any one sin, any one sin, Adam's sin was plenty, any one sin is enough to condemn you forever to everlasting hell. But you and I have committed many sins. When we add to that the fact that James tells us that to break one commandment is to be guilty of all of them. Each time you sinned, whether in your thoughts or in your intentions of your heart or in your actual actions or in that imputed sin from Adam, every single one of them makes you guilty of breaking all ten of the commandments. And as a matter of fact, we don't have time to look at it this evening, but it can be demonstrated that any one sin does in fact break them all. And consider that you have committed every single one of these sins not just against other people, but against a God who is infinitely righteous and holy. Now, when you consider that, just how pristine and innocent was your life before coming to the Lord? I mean, you don't have as bad a past and as a dramatic uh, transformation as others. I would say, if you're a Christian here uh, this evening, that transformation was radical, and the Lord has saved you from, uh, well, Eternity in hell, he dug you out of a pit that you never could have escaped. God has had mercy upon you. You have deserved hell, not just once, but many times. And deserved to suffer eternally in these agonizing flames. That was your condition. But now that's, again, just the beginning. It's not the end. Your situation was even worse than this. Because some of you were actually taught better than that by your parents who were very you know, painfully, and, and you know how painfully that can be, were painfully trying to instruct you in the ways of the Lord, who taught you exactly what the Lord wanted. Now that means that you're even more responsible for the sins that you committed. That fact that you knew better actually exacerbates your sin. Jesus said, on one occasion, that judgment would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. And again, if you read the Old Testament and you consider the acts of wickedness that were committed back there, I, every time I get to Sodom and Gomorrah, I cringe at the sins committed by that city. And yet, we read in the New Testament that Jesus preached and he taught on the streets of Capernaum. He performed very few miracles because they, they would not believe in him. But we don't give Capernaum a second thought as far as wickedness, and yet Jesus says that it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for Capernaum because they had greater light. They had greater truth. They knew better, whereas Sodom and Gomorrah did not. That's the reason why God had mercy on Nineveh, too. They had no instruction in righteousness. They didn't know, as it were, the difference between their left and right hand. God had mercy on them because of their ignorance with greater understanding, with greater light and truth comes greater responsibility. How many times have you heard the word of the Lord, even before you came to him? Uh, perhaps heard it read, or maybe listened to sermons preached. How many times did you sin 
knowing better that you should not do this. Well, the fact is, again, that your past is much worse than you think it is. The most innocent among you, among all of us here, were hell-deserving sinners. We all deserved it. Now, you must know that. You must know that's true. Otherwise, you never would have come to Jesus in the first place. But you need to understand it more fully now so that you will see how much you ought to love the Lord. Because the one who has forgiven much loves much. And if you don't think you've been forgiven of much, you're really not going to be moved very much to serve the Lord. Now, what about the sins you've committed since coming to Christ? Those sins, our, our confession reminds us, again, Puritans were very thorough that those sins deserve hell as well as the ones you committed before you came to Christ. Now remember that God does forgive you when you come to him. There is full and complete pardon. All the sins you've committed have been forgiven. All the sins you will commit uh, presently or are committing will be forgiven. All the sins that you will commit in the future are going to be forgiven when you believe in him, all of them are canceled out, but that doesn't mean that those sins don't deserve hell. Those sins actually do, and they would condemn you if it were not for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about the sins that, that we commit now as opposed to the sins we committed then, especially if we committed them in ignorance before, or even if we had some knowledge. Think about how much more knowledge you have now how many more benefits you have now, and yet you still sin against the Lord. You even have the Spirit of God working inside of you to move you in the right direction, and still you sin. Think about how much punishment those sins actually deserve. And there are still sins in the future. I mean, we're not done sinning yet, sadly. That's a sad fact of life. There are sins that you will yet commit in the future, and those sins are going to be even worse because they're going to be committed against even more grace and more knowledge. Now, again, you need to see these things and acknowledge these things that are true. If you're ever going to have the kind of love that moves you to the kind of thankfulness that you should have for what the Lord has done for you, you weren't just a nice person. You were guilty of infinite sins. And actually, you would be guilty still if it were not for the Lord. You need to realize that the sins that you've committed, the kind of rebellion that you've committed against the Lord is the very thing that is going to condemn the devil and his angels to an eternity of hell for rebellion against God, hatred against God. We are guilty of exactly the same thing they are. And that's exactly what we deserve is what they are getting and will get for all eternity and what all the other uh, unbelievers are going to get. That is what you and I deserve. The one who has forgiven much loves much. The one who has forgiven little loves little. Now, Simon was a self-righteous Pharisee. He thought that he was good. He thought that he was a righteous man because he kept God's law outwardly, even though in his heart he did not love the Lord. He didn't see his sin. He didn't see his need of God's love and his mercy. And so thinking that he was really not in need of much forgiveness, he didn't love much. That's what happens when you don't see your sins. Of course, his problem is even worse than that. But the fact is, if you think that you've been forgiven little, you will love little. The question is, how much do you love the Lord? Now, we've already considered that the faith that God gives to us works by love. You already love the Lord. Your heart is already inclined toward him. You love him because he's the epitome of everything that your heart desires if you're a Christian. But there is another kind of love that we should have. And it's a love of thankfulness, the kind of love that this woman had. She had both, of course, but this is the kind that's on display here. And here's another way that you can actually increase your love for him. And in doing so, promote the work that we're actually talking about here this evening. And that is by considering. 
what the Lord has done for you. We've only just looked in a very narrow way, of course, a very important way, what he has, in fact, done for you. He has cleansed you of all your sins, all those things that would have condemned you, even though you thought you were a good person, you were not a good person. The Lord has taken care of that. He has cleansed you. And the Lord continues to cleanse you, for which you ought to be thankful. But he does many, many other things. The Lord guides you and he teaches you. That's what he's doing right now through um, this ordinance, this, this which he has established in this church. The Lord provides for you. Every good thing you have comes from him. If you have any health, if you have any strength today, it's come from the Lord and no other place. You, you know, you're ingratiated to him because of that. He gives to you, of course, his spirit to love him. That's a gift. That's grace. He gives you courage and boldness by his Holy Spirit. Whatever you have comes from him in that regard. Spiritual gifts to serve him and to serve others. And really, all of these things that God gives to you, as well as a desire to use these things for his glory, they're all conspiring together to help you in the end so that when you're finally with the Lord in heaven, you will have a reward. You will have riches in heaven. The Lord has given you all these things to bless you in this way. By God's grace, the Lord is going to bring you through his judgment. When you stand before him on judgment day, you will not be condemned. And by his grace, he's going to bring you into the new heavens and the new earth, where you're going to be able to enjoy his blessings forever and ever. And God is going to make sure that, that you're going to be provided for for the rest of eternity. You see, you have a lot to be thankful for. Not just the forgiveness, but all these other things. This is a way that you can grow in your love for the Lord, is meditate on these things and let your love of thankfulness grow. And of course, don't forget what it costs the Lord to bring these blessings down to you, as we saw this morning. What it costs Jesus uh, personally, and of course, what it costs the Father in giving his Son, but especially our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who became one with us, how he was rich with all the blessings, as it were, of heaven, all the wealth of the world, and yet he became poor. He became a man, born in a lowly condition, born into almost poverty, ministering in virtually poverty, and beyond that, becoming a curse for you at bearing your sins on the cross and being hung on the cross and suffering the wrath of God and dying, uh, the prince of life, actually undergoing death, he did all those things so that you might have all these blessings that we were just looking at. How thankful should you be for all these things? How much should you love the Lord? Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's Christmas. I don't have to tell you that. And you're going to be getting together with friends and relatives, mainly family members and so forth. And you're going to be exchanging gifts if you haven't already uh, done that. And if somebody came up to you at Christmas and they gave you a very expensive gift, one that cost them a great deal, and yet you weren't moved to be thankful, you didn't really love them anymore for this gift they gave to you, how do you think you'd feel? Or how do you think they would feel? If you're the one giving the gift, how would you feel? If you're the one receiving the gift, how would they feel if there was no increase of thankfulness? Well, think about it. Does it honor God? when he gives you all these blessings, and yet your love for him does not increase in return, and you're not thanking him any more than you should. I mean, does that really honor God? If, how does God feel about that, if we can use those, those kinds of terms about him? Well, I'll tell you, it doesn't honor the Lord. Look at how Jesus looked at the Pharisee Simon versus how he looked at the woman and how he commended her acts of love and gratitude. And there's Simon, who's stone cold because he thinks he really wasn't that bad. It makes a big difference. Now, what's the Lord going to do if, if we don't show the kind of thankfulness we should for all the mercies received? Well, the Lord can do a number of things, and a couple of the things that he might do is he might take away some of your assurance. Uh, you're not sure now whether your sins are forgiven, uh, assurance, of course, is knowing that your sins are forgiven, and that's a blessing from God. But if you don't thank God for all the mercy he's shown to you, perhaps he'll take away some of that assurance 
So you'll be a little bit concerned. And then when you seek him for more assurance and you gain it, it'll be much more precious to you. I think that's why the Lord oftentimes doesn't give us a full assurance of our salvation. He wants us to appreciate the gift more before he gives us the assurance that the gift is ours. Perhaps he will teach you how much you really do owe to him by taking away some of the blessings that he's given to you. But if he does these things, remember that he does it for the same reason that he sent his son into the world in the first place. Because he loves you and he wants you to see the value of the gift that he's given to you and he wants you to respond in an appropriate way which is to love him in return. And actually that brings us to the second point. The first point is how much has God really forgiven you? How much has he really blessed you with? Because the one who has forgiven much will love much and the one uh, the more you see what he has forgiven you, then the more you're going to see how much you should love him, and you will, as a matter of fact, love him more. You, you really can't escape it. But this is a motive, and the motive is to live the life of thankfulness, which is a life of faith and repentance in the Lord. Rather than facing God's gracious and loving discipline for not returning to him the kind of thankfulness that we ought to, we should set our hearts on giving him what he deserves for all the love and mercy and grace that he has shown us. And what he wants us to do is basically what we see this woman doing, and that is being thankful, loving him, showing that thankfulness through repentance. Do you think this woman went back out and continued to live the kind of life she was living before? She turned from her sins. She was set free from her sins. Not, not just the guilt of her sin, but the power of her sin. She didn't return to that former way of living. Her faith saved her. The Lord changed her. And she began to live the kind of life that God wanted her to live. And that's what God wants you to do as well. He wants you to deny yourself, turn away from your sins, from seeking your own pleasure and doing your own will. And he wants you to follow him, doing his will, following Jesus' example. Again, remembering that when Jesus died on the cross, you died with him. When he rose, you rose with him in order to live the kind of life he now calls you to live. This is what love should move you to do. And the more you love him, the more you're going to do these things. So it's only those who actually understand how much God has given to them who will ever love him the way that they should. The one who is forgiven much loves much. And so cultivate this love by meditating on his blessings, especially considering what he has saved you from. It was no small thing. Your testimony is, is actually much more dramatic than you can even imagine. If you were to consider, even if God had given to you, even for 10 minutes, what you deserved, and then pulled you out of it, uh, you would see just how thankful you ought to be. But thankfully, we're not going to have to experience even 10 minutes of what we deserved. But the Lord does want us to see what we deserved. And he wants us to be thankful that he has pulled us out of that. He has saved us. He has turned us away from that. Now, one last thing that I want to mention, and that is if you do fall in the other camp of not loving much because you don't believe you've been forgiven much, you do need to realize that Jesus, when he said that to Simon, did not mean to say that Simon was forgiven. He wasn't forgiven of anything. Simon did not love Jesus at all. Simon did not believe in Jesus he and the other Pharisees with him looked at him and said, who is this man who even forgives sin? They didn't trust that he was the son of God. Jesus was just trying to point out to Simon that he didn't see himself as he should, nor did he look at the woman the way he should have. But Simon was, a matter of fact, absolutely defiled and lost in God's eyes in the same way that we were before the Lord saved us. If he had seen himself the way that he should, he would have turned from his sins and embraced Jesus as his Savior and then wept with the woman and perhaps washing his feet also with his tears. 
Now, the Bible says that if you don't love the Lord, you're not a believer. If you don't love the Lord, it's because you don't understand your need of the Lord. If you don't love the Lord, you don't have any sense of, of your, your need of forgiveness and mercy. You certainly haven't experienced it because if you had, you would have to love him. If you don't love the Lord and you're not a believer, you need to experience this mercy and this forgiveness before you're ever going to be able to love him at all. And so if that is your condition this evening, come to the Lord and ask him to open your eyes. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him. Turn from your sins. Ask for his forgiveness. Receive the grace he offers. Remember we saw this morning, Jesus Christ offers himself as a savior to whoever will take hold of him. And he will save you if you will trust in him. And then once he has forgiven you, then you will know what this woman experienced. Then you will know what it's like to love the Lord much because you have been forgiven much. Well, may the Lord encourage us to this example, to love the Lord more, to cultivate this, this understanding of what the Lord has actually blessed us with, the great depths of sin that we were guilty of. It doesn't honor the Lord if we do not understand these things and if we do not acknowledge them and accept them. He is not honored by someone who says, you know, I, I really wasn't that bad and, you know, the Lord had to make up just this much and that's all it took for me to, to arrive at perfection. Those who really honor the Lord are the ones who see the depths of their sin and realize that they deserved hell. But the Lord gave them what they didn't deserve. He changed their direction from hell to heaven. May the Lord show each one of us just those things. May he show us those things about ourselves and all the other blessings he gives us so that we might be motivated to love him and serve him more and do what he calls us to do. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, uh, to do that for us uh, personally.